If we forget where we've been and what we've done, we're not men anymore. Just animals. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 abandoned Game of Thrones storylines. The North remembers. For this list, we'll be looking at plot lines and characters that disappeared or were never fully explained on HBO's fantasy series. Which storyline are you still waiting on answers for? Let us know in the comments below. Number 10, Alaria Sand. Don't leave me alone in this world. Never. At first, Oberyn Martell's partner seemed to be stepping up as a major character. The show didn't necessarily adapt the books series Dawn storyline very well, but it does show Ilaria taking control of the mighty kingdom and becoming an ally to Daenerys Targaryen when she arrives in Westeros. Vengeance. Justice. Fire and blood. Unfortunately, that alliance wouldn't last long. Ilaria and her daughter Tyene are captured by Cersei in season 7 and suffer a pretty terrible fate. Although Tyene is doomed, Cersei's plan is to keep Ilaria alive. Your daughter will die here in this cell. And you will be here watching when she does. You'll be here the rest of your days. But we're still wondering what happened to her years after the show ended. Was she killed like many others when Daenerys sacked King's Landing? Or did she survive to be taken back to Dawn and face punishment for usurping the previous prince? You're not a Dornishman. You're not our prince. Number 9. Thorn's White Hand. What's she got there? To me, Ghost. Bring it here. Got to be good. Season 1 was pretty light on White Walker activity, building towards bigger confrontations down the line. Jon Snow's first brush with the terrors beyond the wall comes when the bodies of missing Night's Watchmen are discovered. When one of them rises as a White to attack Lord Commander Gior Mormont, Jon saves the man's life. Ah! Ah! This event causes Mormont to send Alistair Thorne, Castle Black's master at arms, to King's Landing in order to present the White's hand to King Joffrey as a warning. That should get young Joffrey's attention. And it uh, puts a thousand leagues between you and Thorne. However, we never got this scene, nor was it ever mentioned again. While Thorne was likely met with scepticism as he was in the books, this still feels like a narrative thread the show just dropped. Number 8, Robin Aaron. Mummy, I want to see the bad man fly. It was pretty easy to dislike Robin Aaron when we first met him, but there's no denying that he ruled over one of the most important castles in the show. Though his young age and extremely sheltered upbringing meant he was never really in charge, he still lends his army to Sansa Stark during a crucial battle in season 6. She's my cousin. We should help her. That was my instinct as well. This army also helps during the Long Night and the sack of King's Landing, but Robin Aaron himself isn't seen again until the show's finale. Hi. We never got to see him react to Littlefinger's death or the fact that Littlefinger had been responsible for the death of Robin's parents. Considering how much Robin trusted Littlefinger, this was a definite missed opportunity. Take charge of your life for as long as it lasts. That is what it means to be Lord of the Vale. Number seven, Sir Ilan Payne. Is it him there making a shake? He frightens me too. Look at that face. Arya Stark had many names on her special list, most of which got crossed off by her or someone else's hand. But there's one name that was seemingly forgotten about by her, Sir Ilan Payne. Sir Ilan! Bring me his head. The royal executioner was the one who chopped Arya's father's head off. Although he was under Joffrey's orders, that was more than enough to earn her wrath. Still in pain. The hound. Joffrey. Cersei. Still in pain. However, the character disappeared after the show's second season. It's possible that Ilan was written out due to his actor, Wilco Johnson, undergoing cancer treatment. Thankfully, Johnson pulled through, but Ilan's presence was relegated only to passing mentions from that point forward. I never let them execute you. Is that what you fear? I never let Ilan Payne take your head. You're a Lannister. Number six, White Babies. 
Game of Thrones is home to a lot of despicable characters, though Craster makes an excellent case for the worst. Who's this little girl? You're prettier than half my daughters. The Wildling has multiple daughter wives, though he sacrifices each son to the White Walkers to earn safety, a chilling fact learned by John in the show's second season. <laughs> However, what happens to these babies wasn't shown until season 4, when we saw one of them turned by the Night King. It was a great WTF moment, but it ultimately went nowhere. Are we meant to believe the Night King's generals in season 8 are Craster's sacrifice to children? How did all of them grow so quickly? Sadly, it was in the nature of the White Walkers to be mysterious, so we never got answers. Number 5, Kate. Do I know you? I know you. Danny and company met many odd characters during the Karth storyline of season 2, though none of them captivated us as much as Kate. While she only appeared in two episodes, she piqued our interest through her always masked face and prophecies about Daenerys. There shall come day and night to see the wonder born into the world again. And when they see, there shall lust. For dragons are fire made flesh. And fire is power. We couldn't help but want to see more of her so that we could unravel her mystery. Her mystical abilities and the fact that she hailed from Ashai, Melisandre's birthplace, and the location Danny's dragon eggs came from made us think that she might play a pivotal role. But that wasn't the case. When the Karth storyline came to an end, we never heard from her again. And we still want to know more. Will you betray her again? Never. Number four, Essos. Odras mi machan daor, iderin non machan. Zevi kalon tito porjo guru tari machan. Westeros' neighbouring continent played a vital part for a majority of the show. Bringing peace and ending slavery in its cities was a driving force of Daenerys' character development, and she was, by far, at her most interesting when she was enacting vengeance against its rulers. Dracarys. But as soon as she was able to return home, the so-called Breaker of Chains apparently forgot all about her good work there. We know there was more important conflicts for the show to focus on, but they could still have given us a few scenes there to show what happened to Marine, Astapor, and Yun Kai in Danny's absence. We would have even taken a scene of Danny receiving news via Raven, but nothing was ever given. In Vili Basma Tetostaur! In Vrapa Tolvio Vio Ninronti Raderat! Number three, the faceless men in Westeros. What do you want? A man has a thirst. A man does not drink for a day in the night. A boy could make a friend. First appearing fully in season two, the enigmatic Jakin Hagar immediately drew us in with hints of his assassination organization. So we were delighted to see the character again in season five, along with the headquarters of the Faceless Men, the House of Black and White. You said there was no Jakin Hagar here. There isn't. A man is not Jakin Hagar. Well, who are you then? No one. And that is where Gomez must become. However, there's still so much we don't know. For instance, how did this skillful Jacken get captured in King's Landing? And why did the faceless men send him to Westeros in the first place? We can't even be sure that Season 2 Jacken and Season 5 Jacken are the same person, or if he even exists. Hell, they could be different characters using the same face. But when Arya left Bravos, we had to say goodbye to those questions. Finally, a girl is Noah. A girl is Arya Stark of Winterfell, and I'm going home. Number two, Dawn. I never realized you had such respect for Dawn. The show's handling of the Dawn storyline in season five was justifiably criticized, but that doesn't mean we wanted it to disappear. But that's basically what happened. Kill us! Get it over with! In season 7, Alaria is captured while on the way to collect the rest of her army for Daenerys. After that, no further attempts are made to bring the army into the fold. By anyone. 
and they would have been very useful when, you know, a massive army of the dead showed up. Come on, Daddy! <laughs> Alaria's capture, the only news we hear is of an unnamed Dornish prince supporting Danny, who's then present at Tyrion's trial in the series finale. A sad end to what should have been the most unique of the Seven Kingdoms. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, Dario Naharis. Your Grace, allow me to present the captains of the Second Sons. Miro Bravos, Prendal Negesen, and um, Dario Naharis. We talked about Essos, but Dario Naharis deserves his own entry. Originally a lieutenant for the Cell Swords, the Second Sons, Dario kills the group's leaders to join Daenerys' cause. The Second Sons are yours, and so is Dario Naharis. My sword is yours, my life is yours, my heart is yours. We love a mercenary with a soft spot, and Dario quickly became one of Danny's most interesting allies, as well as her romantic interest. But when Danny leaves Essos, she doesn't take Dario with her. And one of the biggest disappointments of Essos' absence in the show's later seasons was not seeing how Dario temporarily ruled Marine in her stead. There's an alternate reality where Danny never left, and we got to see them rule the city, bringing positive change to the rest of Essos. But we guess that's what fan fiction is for. Farewell, Dario Naharis. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.